Okay, uh, well, uh, good morning from Washington. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I'm Senior Vice President for Economics here at CSIS, and I'm delighted uh, to welcome you uh, here to, uh, we're trying to count whether it's our 16th, 17th, or 18th um, a co annual conference uh, with the Japan External Trade Organization, or JETRO, um, on the future of uh, the economic order in the Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, depending on your preference. It was always Asia-Pacific until, until recently. Um, but uh, we're delighted to have both an audience here in the, in the room, which is a nice uh, change from, uh, from the last couple of years, and also uh, greetings to our online viewers. We know there are people watching from Japan and the rest of Asia, and uh, so good evening to, to all of you as well. Delighted to have you with us. Um, so we have been organizing this conference with JETRO for, uh, since 2005, and we always have a really, um, really interesting, robust conversation about what's going on regionally, and we've been through a lot <laughs> over that period of time, um, pre-TPP, uh, through TPP, to RCEP, to uh, now the IPEF, and if you don't know what all those uh, acronyms stand for, uh, you will by the end of, by the, end of the day. Um, but, um, and, and how the U.S. and Japan, there's a particular accent on how the U.S. and Japan as uh, critical allies in the region can cooperate on uh, those regional economic issues. So I'm, uh, we're going to have a panel up here uh, in a minute, um, and, uh, but we first have two terrific uh, opening um, uh, presentations or comments from uh, um, both uh, our, our co-partner, uh, Mr. Sasaki from JETRO, in a minute, who uh, my colleague Chris Johnstone will introduce. Uh, but I'm going to, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, who is the um, uh, Under Secretary of Commerce for International Trade at the International Trade Administration uh, at Commerce, uh, Marissa Lago. Um, Marissa is Under Secretary Lago, I should say. Um, <laughs> I've known her a long time. Um, so, um, uh, Under Secretary Lago has a distinguished career in public service uh, with ex expertise in international markets, trade, financial regulation, enforcement. Um, I've known her since she was at the SEC here as a um, heading the International Affairs Office there, but she's also worked uh, in the New York City Department of City Planning. Um, she also worked in the Obama administration at the uh, Treasury Department as Assistant Secretary for International Markets and Development. Um, she's also worked at the Boston Redevelopment um, Authority. I mean, there's just, it goes on and on. <laughs> she's done an amazing array of things. Um, and she has a Bachelor, uh, bachelor of Science in Physics um, from uh, Cooper Union, which is, I think, a very interesting uh, background for this job, um, and also, obviously, a Juris Doctor from Cum Laude from Harvard, um, uh, Harvard Law School. So we're delighted she could take time out of her busy, and it is a busy schedule, there's a lot going on, to offer some framing remarks. So with no further ado, Under Secretary Lago, please join me. Well, thank you, Matt, for that kind introduction. And Marisa is always okay for a friend who we've worked with over the decades. It's not just years. And thank you to CSIS generally and to JETRO for hosting today's events. Um, it is such a privilege to be here alongside Mr. Sasaki and the other panelists that you're going to be hearing from, but also to be able to represent the Department of Commerce and very specifically ITA, the International Trade Administration, to discuss the future of the Asia Pacific region. I'm very proud to be part of an administration that is so deeply committed to building a more prosperous and inclusive economy here at home through strengthening the competitiveness of U.S. industry and workers by promoting trade and investment and also by ensuring fair trade practices. ITA's work is at the center of this effort and it's grounded in the conviction that economic security is national security. Beyond expanding prosperity and creating jobs, trade and investment are levers to advance economic and strategic priorities and keep our nation secure from safeguarding supply chains to advancing high standards. This is especially true in the Indo-Pacific, a dynamic region that three out of every five people on our planet 
call home. And that's poised to drive such a significant percentage of global economic growth in the coming years. Now, anyone who is listening in today knows very well that the region is far from a monolith. The priorities and the concerns aren't always the same in Tokyo as they are in Jakarta or Hanoi or Canberra. The United States proudly identifies as an Indo-Pacific nation. What unites the countries of the Indo-Pacific in our mind is a distinct forward-looking ambition and the immense potential that we have to fulfill that ambition. President Biden knows that our engagement in the Indo-Pacific is absolutely essential to ensuring our future prosperity, our economic security, and also our ability to address global challenges. And that's why he's committed to not just renewing but deepening our relationships, as demonstrated during his recent trip to Seoul and to Tokyo. The president's strategy in the region embraces, embraces an affirmative agenda focused on investing in our strengths at home, aligning with like-minded allies and partners, and competing to protect U.S. interests and U.S. values. This administration is committed to bolstering an open, inclusive international system, and ITA embraces our role in that strategy ensuring that U.S. businesses and workers can invest, align, and compete on a level playing field. Whether through our commercial advocacy and export promotions or enforcement and compliance to ensure fair and open markets, the ITA team champions Americans work, American workers in businesses in markets worldwide. ITA is keenly focused on building alliances, uh, building alignment with allies and partners across the Indo-Pacific by cooperating on standards, by setting rules for digital trade and for emerging technologies, and by promoting regulatory interoperability to avoid fractured standards that can create barriers across borders. And I, I hasten to note needless barriers. The cornerstone of our economic engagement in the region is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, or IPEF, which you'll be hearing at, throughout you'll be hearing about throughout today's program. It is grounded in a shared commitment to a free, fair, open, interconnected, resilient, secure, and prosperous Indo-Pacific region. IPEF seeks to deepen commercial relations to advanced shared economic and technology policy priorities and to ensure mutual economic competitiveness for both the United States and our partners in the region. Last month, President Biden launched Pi uh, IPEF, which now includes the United States and 13 partners, which together represent 40% of global GDP. This robust group includes the seven ASEAN members who are also in APEC. Together, we're working to establish a framework that will advance meaningful policy cooperation with the goal of shaping economies that are connected, resilient, clean, and fair. Now, as excited as we are about the launch of IPEF, we also recognize that the real work has just begun. Broad participation will necessarily require complex negotiations, but we firmly believe that a more inclusive framework will yield more consequential and enduring results. And so we're looking forward to these complex and I'd guess challenging negotiations as the way to make progress in the months to come. Now, our engagement in the Indo-Pacific region extends beyond IPEF. We're also committed to engaging through APEC to promote trade, high standards, and inclusive and sustainable growth. I'm particularly excited about APEC's pro uh, progress on the cross-border privacy rules, CBPR, which are APEC-created strong interoperable privacy protections that enhance trust 
and also facilitate cross-border data flows. In April, the United States joined other participants to establish a global cross-border privacy rules forum so as to expand APEC's groundbreaking initiative to more countries across the globe. Now, while we very much value these regional frameworks, like IPEF, like APEC, a APEC, so much of ITA's more immediate progress comes through our many bilateral initiatives in the region, and I'll touch upon a few of them. Given JETRO's sponsorship, it's only fitting to begin with Japan, where our ties are closer than ever. Working through the Japan Economic Policy Consultative Committee, that's a mouthful, so we call it the two plus two, as well as the Japan-US Commercial and Industrial Partnership, JUSIP to those in the know, we're strengthening our policy coordination and improving commercial relations in critical areas that range from semiconductors to the digital economy. And in particular, I want to thank you, Mr. Sasaki and JETRO, for JETRO's warm, substantive participation in the trade and investment work stream of the JUSIP. Now, moving to Australia. In March, Secretary Raimondo welcomed then Trade Minister Tihan uh, to Washington, and they launched the inaugural Australia-US Strategic Commercial Dialogue. It focuses primarily on critical minerals and supply chain resilience, but it also addresses economic coercion and non-market practices. And we look forward to continued discussions facilitated by the arrival of such a skilled and experienced U.S. ambassador in Caroline Kennedy. Our warm relationship with Australia also supports our increased engagement with the Pacific Island countries, including in Fiji and Papua New Guinea, where ITA recently added staff. And we're particularly pleased that Fiji has joined IPEF, and it also plans to send its first ever investment delegation to the Department of Commerce's Select USA Investment Summit, which is being held in National Harbor, Maryland next week. This is part of our whole of ITA effort to drive job creating foreign direct investment across the United States. So continuing our tour of bilateral initiatives, we're pursuing the US-Singapore Partnership for Growth and Innovation, which invites deeper commercial ties in areas such as the digital economy, advanced manufacturing, health care, clean energy, and environmental technologies. And in partnership with the government of India, we're exploring how we can refresh and renew the U.S.-India commercial dialogue and also advance the U.S.-India CEO forum. And this includes the, uh, selecting the U.S. business executives who will participate in meetings that Secretary Raimondo and Minister Goyal will co-chair later this year. So the list goes on and on. And our engagement in the region continues to grow. I'm always especially pleased when we find opportunities in new markets, more emerging markets like Bangladesh. And we hope very shortly to be able to be opening a commercial services office in Bangladesh. Further, with the resumption of more widespread international travel, as evidenced by the panelists who have traveled from across the globe to be here today. Um, our ITA team has resumed its fruitful trade missions to the region. Just this month, ITA led our first clean technology trade mission to Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. As part of this trade mission, participating U.S. companies had scores of meetings with potential buyers and partners. Our ITA team is going to return to the region in September for a healthcare sector business development mission. And this will go to Thailand, Vietnam, and Malaysia. And they'll be back again in October for an advanced manufacturing trade mission to Indonesia, Singapore, and Japan. 
The fact that these trade missions cover such a wide variety of topics shows the breadth of our relations um, and of the economic opportunities in the region. And perhaps most significantly of all, in March of next year, ITA is going to host Trade Winds, which is the US government's largest trade mission and business development forum. And this time it will be in Bangkok with stops in additional countries in the region. I myself am looking forward to visiting Thailand in September where I'm going to be leading the US delegation to the APEC Small and Medium Enterprises Ministerial. It's a vital topic when SMEs comprise 97% of all businesses and employ the majority of workers in APEC economies. We'll continue engaging on this important topic well into 2023 because that's when the United States is the host of APEC. So I hope you get a sense that there is a lot going on in the region. In all of ITA's efforts to deepen commercial ties and policy cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region, I welcome your continued engagement from industry, labor, and other stakeholders, both here in the US and throughout the region. And that's why I am so grateful to CSIS and JETRO for the kind invitation that you extended to me today. Thank you. Thank you so if you could just stay for one second. Um, that's fine. Just, just stay right there. And then, thank you. That was just terrific. Um, real uh, tour d'horizon and tour de force. Um, really terrific um, and gives us a, a, a lot uh, to talk about. We're not going to have enough time to cover um, a third of that, but there's really important things in, in what uh, Undersecretary Lago said that I hope everyone will look into if we don't get to them today. Um, if I could just indulge you, I know you're busy and have to go, but could I ask one question, which others have asked me, um, about IPEF. Um, so it's terrific you got 13 other countries to join. That's the good news, and I think unexpected. It was a great uh, triumph to get that many people to sign on. As you kind of alluded to, now comes the hard part. You have to roll up your sleeves. We're hearing that, that you may end up having all or most countries participating in all four of the pillars of IPEF. A, can you confirm that? Uh, B, if you can't, um, when will we know who's in which pillars? And C, is there a risk that, that this is going to bog down because you're going to have, you know, you've got some countries in there that traditionally have been, you know, challenging partners to negotiate on some of these issues in particular. Can you give us any insight into how this is going to proceed? I have to smile, Matt, um, because that is such a CSIS question. <laughs> in the lead up to IPEF, the question was, oh, it's only gonna be the same old players. You have to reach out, you have to get ASEAN. Um, is if it's just four countries, there won't be the there there. And you are right, through incredibly persistent efforts, and I'll note by Secretary Raimondo personally, she is a secretary who picks up the phone to her counterparts, um, that we were able to attract such a wide array of nations. For those who may not be steeped in all the details of IPEF, there are four pillars, and countries have the option of choosing to join one, two, three, or all four pillars. That process is ongoing, so I'm not at this point going to presuppose the outcome, but that is one of the first orders of business, is determining um, which countries are signing up for which pillars, and you're right, the more countries sign up for a larger number of pillars, the more complex it's going to be. But that is a challenge. Um, I wouldn't call it a problem. We absolutely welcome having the opportunity to roll up our sleeves, um, to have our expert chief negotiators backed up by large teams of subject matter experts and do the work. I do think that some of the pillars may be easier than others, and that is why for each of the pillars, countries are choosing to assign negotiators and subject matter experts, and so we'll be proceeding on four parallel tracks and won't let some of the harder pillars bog down the entirety. Okay, terrific. Well, that's, that's very helpful in, in giving us that's very helpful in giving us a sense of how this is going to work. Uh, there's probably going to be, it's going to be complex, but, but it's good that you've got a plan. 
So uh, please join me again in thanking Under Secretary Lago, who does that for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us. And then Chris, up to you. Good morning, uh, everyone, um, both to our audience here in person and to the, the many uh, who are tuning in online. Uh, and thanks again to Under Secretary Lago for a really terrific set of framing remarks. Uh, my name is Chris Johnstone. I am a senior advisor and the new Japan chair uh, here at CSIS. Uh, and it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Nobuhiko Sasaki, chairman and CEO of the Japan External Trade Organization. Uh, chairman Sasaki assumed his current post in 2019 and has ever since steadily led Jetro's efforts to promote trade uh, and investment between Japan and the rest of the world. Uh, before joining Jetro, Chairman Sasaki worked at the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry for over three decades, where he held a number of distinguished positions, including Director General for the Trade Policy Bureau and Vice Minister for International Affairs. And for those of you here who know, those are uh, two of the most important positions in the ministry. He was also an advisor at Tokyo Marine and Nichido Fire Insurance Company and Corporate Executive Vice Chairman at Fujitsu Limited. He is uniquely suited to kick off our discussion today with an overview of the key issues animating the economic policy debate in the Asia-Pacific region. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Chairman Sasaki back to CSIS. Welcome, sir. Thank you for a kind introduction. I'm Nobuhiko Sasaki, Chairman and CEO of Jetro. First, uh, thank you for joining us today. I would like to extend my appreciation to the CSIS for all the cooperation you have provided us for today's seminar. I would also like to thank Under Secretary of Commerce for International Trade, Marisa Lago, for her very impressive opening remarks. This seminar has been held every year since 2005 under the theme of trade in the Asia Pacific. Due to the pandemic, last year's seminar was held online. This is the first time for me to visit Washington, D.C. in three years. I know most of you are watching online, but I'm very happy to be able to speak in person today in front of all of you in the audience. It has been five years since President Trump declared U.S. withdrawal from the TPP in 2017. In these five years, the U.S.-China conflict has become fixed. Both the U.S. and China have imposed additional tariffs, which are still in place. The most significant change that occurred in Asia during that period was the strengthening of economic relations between China and ASEAN. Let us look at this in terms of degree of trade linkage. You may not be familiar with degree of trade linkage, but it refers to the closeness of trade relations with ASEAN from the perspective of the US and China. If this, this figure exceeds one, the trade relationship with ASEAN is closer than the world average. And if it is below one, it is below the average. The China ASEAN linkage level increased significantly from 1.39 in 2011 to 1.90 in 2021. The US ASEAN linkage declined from 0 0.80 to 0 0.71. Japan ASEAN also declined from 2.32 to 1.99. Economic integration through various frameworks without the US has also made progress. In January of this year, RCEP came into effect. Regions accounting for approximately 30% of the world's GDP and population are now covered by a single set of rules in areas such as rules of origin, customs procedures, intellectual property right, and e-commerce. Discussions on the CPTPP are moving forward. Negotiations with the UK are progressing, 
and discussions on market access are underway. China and Taiwan applied for membership in September 2021, and Ecuador also applied in December. South Korea is also preparing its domestic procedures for application, and many other countries have expressed interest in joining. In a survey by ICS, prominent Singaporean think tank, titled The State of Southeast Asia 2022 Survey Report, 76.7% of experts from ASEAN countries said that China is the most economically influential power in the ASEAN region. However, only 30% said they welcome that influence. Meanwhile, a low 9.8% said the U.S., but nearly 70% said they welcome U.S. influence. Japan, followed by the U.S., are far ahead of China as countries that do the right thing for the global community, with more than 50% of respondents saying so. The U.S., for which active commitment is expected, and Japan, which is most trusted, need to join hands to contribute to the establishment of a new framework and rules for the region. At this juncture, the launch ceremony of IPEF was held in Tokyo in May. It consists of four pillars, trade, supply chains, clean energy, decarbonization, and infra infrastructure, and tax and anti-corruption. It will address a variety of issues facing Asian countries, and we commend the U.S. for its leadership in these areas. According to a survey of ASEAN companies conducted by the ASEAN Business Council and JETRO in January and February of this year, digitalization, supply chain connectivity, and sustainability were the top three growth areas in ASEAN where investment is expected over the next 10 years. IPEF is expected to support these growth areas. An important trend particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, is the rapid growth of cross-border data flows. The volume of world's cross-border data flows has exp expanded about six-fold since 2015. The expansion is particularly remarkable in the Asia-Pacific region. The digital shift is accelerating after 2020, including increased data transfers due to the expansion of remote work around the world and the use of big data for infection tracking. In addition, the cross-border e-commerce market is expected to expand from $900 billion to $5 trillion between 2020 and 2027. Data is becoming increasingly important for solving business and social issues. It is necessary to create an environment in the wider region where data can freely come and go across borders while ensuring trust in terms of privacy and security. But in Asia, restrictions on data free flow and demands for excessive data localization have been adopted by some countries and are spreading as a new digital protectionism. Deterring these trends is an urgent and top priority issue to maximize the value of data for sustainable global growth. IPEF needs to respond to these challenges. In terms of digital trade rulemaking, the US-Japan Digital Trade Agreement, which is more advanced than the CPTPP, came into effect in January 2020. The US and Japan should take the lead in establishing digital rules based on trust at IPEF in a way that is beneficial to participating members. Furthermore, from the perspective of Asia, the reality remains that globalization through free trade is the driving force of economic growth. It is strongly expected that the US will continue to lead the economic order in the Asia Pacific 
region while properly addressing the shadow side of globalization. We hope that the U.S. will eventually return to the CPTPP, ideally after addressing new issues of the 21st century in IPEF. We hope for the U.S. to update the CPTPP and develop new rules for plurilateral by like-minded countries with the CPTPP as the core. And we hope for this to pave the way to WTO reform as well. After all, was this not the original purpose of the US pushing for the TPP in the first place? In the following panel, panel session, experts in these fields will have a lively discussion on the future of economic order in the Asia-Pacific region. I am eager to hear insight on issues such as the role of RCEP or the CPTPP in rulemaking in the region, expectations toward IPEF and its challenges, the pathway to WTO reform, and so on from each of our panelists today. I would like to finish by expressing my hope that it will be a catalyst for realizing future prospect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman, Saki, for those terrific uh, remarks. Uh, I think they did a great job in framing some of the issues that we'll now transition to discussing in a, in a panel format. Um, so I invite uh, Simon and Matt to join me on stage. Um, and we should have a couple of virtual uh, participants as well. Okay. There we go. Do we have our virtual they should be. participants? There we are. There we are. Great. All right, terrific. Well, again, thanks to, to all of you for joining us, uh, both online and in person. We're going to transition now to a panel discussion, uh, building on the very fine remarks from Chairman Sasaki just now. Uh, we have two participants uh, uh, on stage here and two virtual, uh, and I'll do some uh, brief introductions uh, before we get into, uh, into the discussion. Um, first, joining us from, uh, from Beijing, Dr. Xinchuan Tu, Dean and Professor at the China Institute for WTO Studies at the University of International Business and Economics. Uh, again, joining us from China. Uh, Dr. Tu received his PhD in International Trade from the University of International Business and Economics in 2004 and was a visiting scholar uh, here in Washington at Johns Hopkins SAIS from 2006 to 2007. And his research uh, and teaching focus on Chinese trade policy, the WTO government procurement, U.S. trade policy, uh, and U.S.-China trade relations. Next, also joining us virtually, is Dr. Obamie, a professor uh, at the Faculty of Law at Kanagawa University. Uh, she obtained her MA and PhD in Advanced Social and International Studies uh, from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Tokyo. And she specializes in the development of regionalism in East Asia and the Asia Pacific as well as theories of, of regional integration. So thank you again for joining us virtually. Uh, on stage with me, uh, two uh, distinguished colleagues. First on my right, uh, Matt Goodman, uh, Senior Vice President for Economics at CSIS. A variety of distinguished positions uh, before joining CSIS, including on the National Security Staff, uh, National Security Council Staff uh, at the US Department of State, uh, and then outside of government at Albright Stonebridge Group uh, and at Goldman Sachs. Uh, and then further on my right is, uh, is Simon Tay, chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. Uh, Simon is also concurrently a tenured prof associate professor teaching international law at the National University of, of Singapore, faculty of law, and had a number of numerous uh, public appointments uh, prior to assuming that position. So thanks to all of you again for joining us. I'll lead a, a discussion and then we'll try to save some time for a question or two from the audience as well. Um, Dr. Tu, if I might start with you. Um, the economic uh, architecture of the region is evolving with initiatives such as RCEP, 
uh, and CPTPP, uh, was, as was discussed by Chairman Sasaki. President Biden, as, as was noted, rolled out, uh, participated in the launch in Tokyo of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. I wonder uh, if China has a vision uh, for the future of the economic order in the Asia-Pacific uh, that you might be able to set out for us. Thank you. I'm sorry, you're muted, Dr. Tu. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, thank you for inviting me to attend the event uh, jointly hosted by uh, CSIS and Jetro. Uh, actually, my last visit to the United States was for the 2019 session of this seminar. Uh, I'm glad to be back, uh, despite uh, virtually. I'm also glad that uh, the title of the event and the question for me still refers to the term of Asia Pacific. Uh, which I thought is already replaced by Indo-Pacific in the United States. Uh, although uh, China has a long and complicated history uh, with India, Asia-Pacific is much more comfortable regional identity for China. Anyway, in, res in response to your question, I would like to share uh, some of my uh, viewpoints. Uh, firstly, uh, China, of course, has a vision for the future of the economic order in the region. Uh, China is always in the middle of the region and cares a lot about uh, the uh, development of the region. Uh, but uh, it does not mean that uh, China has a new or innovative, or innovative design for this order. I, I would say China prefers to keep, uh, uh, to keep the status quo largely uh, while making incremental improvements along with other regional partners. Uh, actually, I don't like the term of order very much because uh, it uh, implies a somewhat uh, hierarchic uh, system. Uh, in history, uh, China had been the single power in the region for centuries and uh, established a so-called China-centric uh, tributary system. Now China is getting back uh, to his historical position in terms of economic and the military power, but China would never try to rebuild the hierarchic system. Uh, we have an old saying that uh, don't do to others what you don't want others to do you. So the history of China in uh, the 20th, uh, the, uh, the, the later uh, 19th century and uh, early 20th century is a bad memory for us. Uh, since 1979, China has been benefiting a lot from the rules-based global market economy system. Uh, there is no any reason for China to damage the existing multilateral uh, system in which all economies can do business with each other voluntarily and equally. Uh, this is the reason why China has repeatedly claimed to support the WTO. Uh, and we are glad to see that uh, the US and China uh, cooperated well uh, in the just finished uh, MC12. Um, uh, on the basis of the WTO rules, China is also pleased to establish closer trade relations with, with its neighbors, either through bilateral or regional initiatives. Now China has FTAs with almost all major trading partners in the region. Uh, but none of these uh, FTAs are aimed to establish an order which is in favor of or in the charge of China. The most recent one, RCEP, is not led by China, but ASEAN. So for China, its vision for the future economic order in Asia Pacific is just to maintain and deepen the regional openness and the integration. Uh, secondly, China is taking real action to implement the vision of Asia Pacific integration as shown by its application to join the CPTPP. CPTPP is more Asia Pacific than ASEP because it has some members from the other side of Pacific. For China, CPTPP is the most convenient approach to join the regional integration. There is high consensus among Chinese scholars that CPTPP represents the new high standard of marketization and liberalization. It is also difficult for China to meet all the rules in CPTPP in short time, but China has taken some concrete steps. For example, the Chinese Congress just ratified two ILO conventions on forced labor in April. You can see that the positive development of economic integration 
could help to promote the universal standards among different countries. CBDPP also has high requirements on state-owned enterprises, which are particularly difficult for China because China still has a large state sector. But the key obligation for SOEs in CBDPP is to do business with commercial considerations. This is not new and consistent with the direction of uh, China's SOE reform. Joining CBDPP could accelerate the reform for the Chinese leadership. Introduction and the implementation of well-accepted international rules is an easier way to overcome domestic opposition and imitate good conduct of practices of other advanced countries. Thirdly, while there should be no hierarchic order in the regional economic system, the position of every, every country in the regional value chains and the division of labor is different. Some will hold the high-end, high-value-added capital and technology intensive industries, while some will stay in low-end, low-value-added labor and resource intensive industry. This is largely a market-driven outcome and mostly decided by the resource endowments and the institutions of each country, but sometimes affected by market or political power of certain players. In other words, every country has different international competitiveness according to the logic of market economy. But the market economy doesn't, does not guarantee the fairness of outcomes in terms of either domestic distribution or international comparison. Therefore, some participants will have some grievance about the existing order or system. These complaints should be taken care of through cooperative actions rather than confrontation or detachment. No country is forced to join the system. There is always space and chance for further cooperation. Of course, bigger participants and beneficiaries should make more contributions. China's Belt and the Road Initiative is designed to share China's experiences and resources with uh, regional partners. Building infrastructure and attracting FDI are two critical factors behind China's economic success. Now China is ready to play the role of capital and technology supplier. I believe it would be very beneficial for the development of the region, especially of those less developed members. Uh, I should stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tu, for those remarks. Uh, quite a good a comprehensive overview of China's view of the economic order and a strong pitch for accession to CPTPP, so thank you. Let me turn now to, uh, to Dr. Oba. Uh, Japan is, of course, very much at the forefront of shaping economic rules uh, and norms for regional trade and, and developing standards for the digital economy of the future, among other areas. How do you envision Japan's leadership uh, in the various economic frameworks of the region, Dr. Oba? Over to you. Yeah, uh, yes. Um, it's very glad to be here, Noor, and by the online, and uh, as a panelist in the, such a previous webinar. So I really, I, I really want to thank to the, uh, the C, uh, CSIS and uh, uh, RIP. And I really, I really regret that I can't visit Washington DC this time, but I try to contribute to the discussion here. So Japan used to be a very passive in, in the international and regional politics. So, but such passive attitude has already changed. So especially since the 2000s. So Japan has been taking a leadership role to promote the various regional frameworks like TPP and CPTPP and RCEP. In the pattern of this negotiation, uh, uh, the Japan has shown the comprehensive vision for the regional order in the idea of the free and open in the Pacific. The FOIP emphasizes the importance of the rule-based regional order. And the current issue is what kind of the rule-based order should be established. This also is about the economic order. The Japan's rule in the Indo-Pacific is how to contribute to the formation of the new regional order here. The core elements of the CPTPP and RCEP are the trade and investment liberalization, advancing free and open liberal order. So, but now 
Japan tried to take a more deliberate approach with uh, considering some element other than the just only free and open. So there are two reasons. The first, we are facing the escalation of the strategic competition so, uh, between the United States and China, and it massively affects the economic environment in the region. And the second, it is that uh, uh, limitation of and uh, uh, def uh, deficiencies of the globalization itself have been exposed now, including the widening in, uh, in equalities, a damage to the environment, and the violation on the workers' right. So under these circumstances there, there are some priority for Japan and the region. The first, the development of the digital technology and economy is more important for Japanese economy and society and this region as a whole. So Japan must improve our age in digital and other advanced technologies by promoting cooperation on the development of the technology with like-minded countries. So, and uh, implement so digital technology in society in order to revitalize our own economy. And the digital economy is a key element to accelerate the economic prosperity in the region, in the, in, in the, region, the, in the Pacific. And the second, Japan must construct the stable supply chain networks regarding the high technology with also the like-minded countries not only for the Japan economy, uh, developing the development of data economy and the construction of the stable supply chain and the critical issue for the whole in the Pacific. So we need to make new rules to manage digital as well as the supply chain resilience. And third, Japan must commit on the clean energy and the decarbonization for the improvement of the climate change issue. So Prime Minister Kishida, so had already proposed the concept and the Asia Zero Emissions Community and indicated that Japan will play a leading role in the promoting decarbonization, especially in the Indo-Pacific. So, however, uh, prioritize the uh, environment, uh, environmental consideration so may, uh, may be incons inconsistent with the logic of the corporate activities and, uh, and the private sector activities that had driven the globalization to date. The logic of the globalization has been supported by the free and open economic order, but rule within that uh, order required us to uh, make appropriate modif modification, modify, uh, modification, sorry, modification. From the Japanese viewpoint, the IPEF has the potential to be a useful framework. The IPEF is composed of the four pillars, connected economy, including making high standard rule on the digital economy. At second is the resilient economy, including supply chain commitment. The third one is a clean energy and a clean economy, including the commitment on the clean energy and the decarbonization. And the fourth pillar is a fair economy, including anti-corruption. These include Japan's issues of the interest, as I mentioned. The, I, the important point is that, that not only Japan, but also the other countries like India, LOK, Fiji, and the seven ASEAN countries have joined it. So in, India, and, uh, and India and ASEAN countries inherently avoid taking side between the China and the United States. Their join in the IPEF indicated that, that these countries even these countries share the interest about uh, making new rules on the regional economic order, and they participate in specific projects as long as they find their own benefit in them. So many analysts doubt the uh, effectiveness of this framework because it lacks all the market access element. However, the IPEF could provide us with a polar in which we can examine the new and important topics beyond the market access and the collaborator making high standard rule about it, about them. On the other hand, the, especially the United States and Japan have, have to make ITEC more attractive by promoting specific and effective cooperation and rule making and uh, uh, dialogue and uh, making concrete outcomes. So in this framework, 
But Japan role in the Indo-Pacific is, is how to contribute to the formation of the new regional order. So in particular, new rules need to be formed for the economy. And the CPP and RCEP are comprehensive in nature. And the rule established by them will be consistently expanded and modified. I believe that the Japan role is to contribute to the creation of the new rules. So by making use of these and uh, IBIC as well. The, uh, lastly, I believe that Japan will play a bridging role along the various regional powers, including Asian countries and the United States, in the process of the, an order formation in the Indo-Pacific region. So in which not only great powers, but also middle and small powers sustain and join their prosperity. So I, I end up. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Oba. That was a terrific overview of Japan's uh, perspective on these issues. Let me now turn to Simon. Very interested in your take from where you sit in Southeast Asia, the vital role that ASEAN plays in so much of the region's economic architecture. Uh, what is the, the blueprint for regional economic order uh, from Singapore's perspective? Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, CSIS and Jetro in particular, for inviting me here. I'm delighted to be here in person. I'm sorry to miss our virtual uh, panelists. I was hoping to see some of them. Uh, I, I take your challenge to talk about ASEAN. I, I think uh, Singapore and my institute, I in particular, are perhaps closer to America and Japan than some of our ASEAN friends. But I think my job here is to try to reflect the ASEAN-wide view, if I may. Uh, and secondly, I would take that, in a way, beyond the technicalities of IPEF or RCEP and CPTPP, we're sitting here in a very different context. Uh, this also is my first trip to America post-pandemic. And really, when we look at that way, the resilience of open trade and the ideals that have stood for a generation are really under pressure from the panic and the national priorities during the pandemic, uh, trumping the established trade rules. And of course, when I use the word trumping, President Trump himself so openly uh, insisting on American interests ahead of all else. We're past that, perhaps, but I think we can't pretend we're back to where we were. Uh, this is particularly because new factors have arisen, like the war in Ukraine, which has both geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, questions for the international rule-based order. So in this sense, uh, if we were talking about trade in relatively uh, trade law terms in the past, uh, rationality, uh, 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 economic market certainties, uh, we're dealing with a much more politicized, securitized way today. And I think uh, what we think of as the ASEAN view must take this into account, particularly because of the cold war of a kind that's come to our region. Uh, kind of a war by non-military means almost, uh, so far at least. And with that, uh, the tensions in trying to find uh, our vision, or a Chinese vision, or an American or Japanese vision, uh, these are really not innocent questions of trade policy. They really are very mixed questions uh, at the highest level. So I do still believe in resilience, efficiency, and benefits for all. Uh, but I am aware that many people don't, that the win-win life that we thought was very uh, within reach is now subject to kind of uh, uh, not just this global cold war, but also within societies to kind of civil war uh, of the winners and losers. So in this sense, I think we're really talking about this at a time where the system we're used to is under a lot of strain and perhaps cracking. So with that sort of context of changes, what could we possibly see? I think one of the great shifts that's coming about is this uh, uh, question of inclusive rational globalization as opposed to friend shoring, decoupling, bifurcation. I think I can short, speak in these shorthand terms in this audience because I think all of us understand the shades of difference between these things. Uh, we really think that the goal of ASEAN to remain equally uh, uh, partner with the different uh, uh, major powers, that is something we need to defend. Uh, that we can listen to the Chinese talk about dual circulation in the near abroad, and 
hope to benefit from that. That we are turning up in Tokyo to talk about IPEF and hope to contribute and also benefit from that. That we are the chairman of RCEP in a very inclusive way. And a number of us, including my country, Singapore, are very active in CPTPP. And we can also do that. So basically, I come here with a view that for the countries of ASEAN between these major powers, our first vision is to remain able to have partnerships of all these different relevant parties, rather than being forced to choose in some way, economically or otherwise. And therefore, this idea of friend shoring, decoupling, if it comes into, uh, to get back to the Bush years, you're either for us or against us sort of rhetoric. That's highly uh, a worry for us. I think we're not there yet, but the question is trying to emerge of whether IPEF or CPTPP could be kind of an inc uh, uh, inclusive or else a kind of geoeconomic version of the Quad or ARCUS. I, I think that's a big question for us, and we'll therefore be looking to see what Under Secretary, Secretary Raimundo, etc., all do, uh, and of course try to contribute to that in our own way. Why? It's our tradition of openness, you know, being that uh, a small country perspective. We morph from idea of ASEAN as a zone of neutrality and uh, 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 peace, a very sort of hippie-like terms, to the idea of a centrality, where we hoped to be the player to actively reach out to all these countries. And now we're kind of a bit nervous about both, frankly. It's hard to be central when everyone's sort of, you know, starting to contest more and more. The space between is shrinking. Uh, and I think in this sense, I myself think that we are coming back to a way, a danger of what ASEAN used to be. When we were colonized, not, not physically colonized, but neo-colonialism of economic kind, dividing the region because, you know, in the bad old empire days, Singapore never traded with Indonesia because we belonged to the British and they to the Dutch. And so I think this is where the, the seeds of that concern are. We say it in politics, and that's my job here to say it in terms of economic relationships. Um, coming to the technology issue, I think this is the hottest arena contestation. Uh, and this is not really something that uh, uh, we're comfortable to see America or China set the rules alone. Uh, in a way, I have to bring up that we've already been hit by this. Uh, there was a Singapore company, uh, Broadcom, was trying to buy Qualcomm, and that was stopped under Sisyphus. Uh, Yes, the owner is a Chinese man from Malaysia. He's prepared to move his headquarters to America. It was in Singapore. We, we couldn't see any shadow of a China security interest. But that was just one very early example of what is happening uh, in this field. Uh, and we're frightened that really what is, could be a very global system uh, uh, is going to become this you know, uh, smaller system. And therefore, inefficiencies, exclusion, all those things uh, come up. And, and it's to the point where, uh, several times we've touched upon this, it's difficult to talk about the Indo-Pacific, which is somewhere in the title, as opposed to the Asia-Pacific, which is the term most of ASEAN still uses. And so I think, Chris, that's roughly where I am on this problem of having to choose. And the technology issue is certainly not going to away. In fact, it's going to get hotter, and I think it will play back into politics with particularly uh, China's chip diplomacy. Can we call it that? Uh, literally uh, putting, giving them more chips to play with uh, in terms of pl playing themselves out of the uh, geopolitical corner in something much more relevant and potentially hotter. If I could conclude, uh, this just, you know, for starting remarks, um, I think there's every reason to be interested in the region and I hope the 600 million plus people in ASEAN. The ASEAN agenda is very much our own. We've come through a tough time in the, in the pandemic, as I'm sure many other countries have. But we're confident that the fundamentals that we were noted for are still there. And in this effort to come out, we're going to emphasize a green economy, sustainable economy, as well as digital economy as cross-cutting issues across all the other sectors that have been our traditional strengths. We are looking for partners. We know that while we're growing quickly, that a lot of the technology, the capital are elsewhere. And that's always been part of the ASEAN logic to be both fairly integrated as a community, but an open regionalism that allows partners to play. The question then comes about what the intention of those partners are. Uh, I think I'm happy to talk about the CPTPP application of China later, 
But more broadly, uh, the question is, going back to the word inclusion, uh, Kishida-san, the, the Premier of Japan, used that term in Tokyo. So did my Prime Minister. But in recent speeches, while the Japanese list of inclusion is very long, China is not there. Uh, I myself feel that you know, I'm Chinese, uh, not by nationality, but by heritage. And I just don't want to see a sign across the whole region that says, neither Chinese nor dogs need apply. I think we have to really think through this. I, I don't mean to be China naive. There are a lot of questions of what China is doing. Uh, with due respect to Dr. Tu, there are a very well-meaning group of internationalists who don't speak for the China that some of us experience. Uh, China has also broken a lot of the trade rules, uh, also been accused of wolf warrior diplomacy, or in fact, undiplomatic wolf warrior behavior. And we really, in ASEAN, feel a bit of the pressure on both sides. We're trying to cope, and one of the mechanisms is really to find as many partners, whether large, multilaterals, or bilaterals, and initiatives that my small country is taking on a number of fronts. I should stop here. Simon, thank you. Terrific. Characteristically candid and, uh, and thought-provoking, as always. Your description of the gathering storm clouds, if you will, that surround uh, the, the regional economic order. So thank you. Uh, Matt, let me turn to you now. Um, we've heard a lot about IPEF today, from Undersecretary Lago, from Chairman Sasaki, from some of our panelists. What's your assessment of, of IPEF, um, uh, the, the, the launch, and what it means for U.S. economic leadership in the region? Great. Thanks, Chris. Really interesting comments. I'm delighted to have um, had that, those inputs to sort of reflect uh, as a background on, on sort of what I'm going to say. So Dr. Tu, Dr. Oba, and Simon, thank you for that. Um, so look, there's a lot to like about IPEF, and I'd say in particular three kind of things uh, that I like about it. One, um, it's a s sign that the Biden administration really understands the imperative for the United States to have you know, a credible, durable economic strategy in this region, whether you call it the Indo-Pacific or the Asia-Pacific, um, the U.S. has to be there as an economic power as well as, as a, a military and diplomatic power. So, um, so I think uh, that this is a sign that the Biden administration understands that. And um, you know, just reflecting back on Sasaki-san's slides, excellent slides, um, you know, that those numbers showing the the relative sort of integration of U.S., Japan, and China with um, ASEAN should really worry <laughs> the United States um, from just a sort of competitiveness point of view, but also from a, you know, from a strategic point of view, um, as well as those sort of misaligned numbers about whether the U.S. is considered to be, you know, influential in the region versus um, the, de the desire for the U.S. to be an active uh, player in the region. Um, but I think this is a sign that the, the administration gets that, that, that there's a demand signal in the region for the U.S. to be engaged economically. Um, you know, secondly, this is a, it's, a, it's a good menu of issues and topics for the U.S. to engage with regional partners on. Again, going back to Sasaki-san's slide showing you know, which are the big areas for um, ASEAN development. Um, I think it had, um, you know, it had digital, the digitalization, um, um, resilient supply chains, and, uh, and sustainability were the first three uh, big ones. Well, those are right at the heart of the IPEF agenda. They're, they're the, uh, some of the core issues in there. And so I think the administration has chosen a good set of issues for U.S. interests, uh, because all of those things are things, um, uh, whether they're in trade or supply chains or, or clean energy or infrastructure or um, uh, anti-corruption, uh, that where the U.S. has strong interests, and the region, I think, also wants to engage. Um, regional partners want to engage on those issues. You know, there may be details and differences over exactly what rules or standards we want, but I think everybody has a, a, a desire to talk about you know all of those issues with the United States. So I think it's a it's a good menu of of, of issues. Um, if I can just digress for two seconds, one of the uh, alphabet soup acronyms I did not mention when I introduced Under Secretary Lago was APEC, and I'm glad that several people have mentioned APEC. I'm a big fan of, of APEC, um, and um, I think the fact that Under Secretary um, Lago mentioned that the U.S. 
in hosting APEC next year wants to make progress on, uh, on uh, cross-border privacy rules and on the broader issue of, of uh, data and digital governance, I think is absolutely critical. Sasaki-san also talked about this. I think that's central to U.S. interests and what we should be putting more weight on than almost anything else on this whole agenda, although there are lots of important things on this agenda. And f the third thing that I like about, about um, IPEF is that it is uh, consistent with a, um, a, a, an approach to rulemaking and norm setting in this region, again, Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific, um, that again reflects an APEC approach. Um, it's something that you know, gets um, a broad group of, of partners together to talk about you know, our shared objectives and um, uh, the principles underlying uh, the kind of economic relationship we want to have and it advances in a sort of soft rulemaking way, or it could do that if it, if it works. Um, um, it could advance uh, sort of common uh, standards and, and norms, which I think is, is very powerful. And in that context, it could be consistent, it is consistent, I think, with what is the ultimate US interest, and I'm gonna say it, Sasaki-san said it, um, I'm gonna say it as well, uh, which is for the United States to return to a comprehensive, high standard, regional trade agreement that is approved by legislatures throughout the region. You can call it TPP, you can call it a banana, but, um, but the United States has a compelling interest in being part of such an arrangement. And I think ultimately we will gravitationally be pulled back into that. Um, and this IPEF approach on my third point is consistent with, because all these topics are things that, or many of them, that would be captured in such an arrangement. So um, I, I think it's promising on those levels. You know, the questions around APEF are partly organizational. That's why I asked Under Secretary Lago about, uh, you know, who's going to be in which groups and how are they going to handle the negotiations. I think there are a lot of questions about that. There are questions in that organizational um, bucket about, you know, what's going to be the ultimate outcome. Are there going to be a series of agreements? Um, you know, are there going to be one big agreement? When is that going to happen? How's it going to be enforced? I mean, there are a bunch of sort of organizational and process questions. Um, then there is a, a core substantive question, which I think a lot of us are asking, which is, is the United States going to be able to incentivize partners across this region to agree to the kind of high standards that we want on labor and environment and digital economy and, and many other things uh, that are embedded in IPEF without offering more access to our market? Because traditionally in a trade agreement, we would go to Congress, ask for authority to negotiate, and we would uh, ask for authority to give concessions, you know, more either tariff cuts or other uh, forms of access to our market. And the administration, while they're trying to be a little clever about uh, that they might do things other than tariff cuts that are market access, I'm frankly a little skeptical about that. I think, I think mo or, and, and I think the partners are skeptical about that. It, so we're not offering that. So what are we offering? And, and I think there are some things that are hints of things that, you know, whether to support the clean energy transition or to support more infrastructure investment or capacity building. But there's a lot of devil in the detail there and a lot of uncertainty about exactly what that's going to look like and is it going to incentivize countries to agree to some difficult things for many of these countries, especially if you get beyond the kind of core uh, partners like uh, Japan and Singapore. Um, you know, is India, Indonesia going to agree to some of these high standards? Data localization, uh, India, I think, is going to, and, and Indonesia are going to have a real problem with that if we push it. So I think there are a bunch of questions and, um, and that still have to be answered. But, you know, let's give the admi administration and the partners a chance to, to meet next month and talk those things through and, uh, and, and see if they can uh, make this, uh, uh, you know, an effective uh, forum and, you know, can make it sort of credible and durable as a U.S. offering uh, to the region in economic terms. Thanks, Matt. That was great. I think um, uh, well said on, on IPEF. I think, as you noted early on, the launch was sort of the easy part. Now the hard work begins. I think it was a pleasant surprise, even to some on the inside, how many uh, participants there were at the outset. Uh, but now we'll see how the, how the effort moves forward. Um, Okay, thanks to all of our, our presenters for your, for your thoughts. Uh, we're going to transition now to questions, and I, I'm going to take the liberty of asking uh, the first couple, if I may. 
um, and I'll try to direct them to, uh, uh, to, to give our, all of our panelists a chance to speak. Um, first relates to the role of India. We've had, this, uh, we've had a discussion here about Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific. Um, India is a, is a part of IPEF, uh, was part of the RCEP process at the beginning, but then, then withdrew. Uh, interested in particular um, from Matt and Dr. Tu, how, how do you think about the role of India uh, in the regional economic architecture? Um, so that's question number one. Uh, and question number two on, on CPTPP, for uh, representatives of the two countries that are in fact in CPTPP, how, what do you see as the, the road ahead on the, the various applications for accession that are out there, including that of China, but also the UK, uh, Taiwan, uh, and the interest as was noted by countries like Korea. So maybe first on the India question, uh, Dr. Tu, could I, uh, could I turn to you? You alluded to this a bit in your remarks, but I'd welcome any other perspective you may have. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, India is a very important uh, uh, partner in the region. Uh, I think uh, Indo-Pacific uh, should, uh, should refer to India first, uh, or India is probably the center of this, uh, <laughs> this concept. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, economic uh, integration, uh, India has been uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, less ambitious uh, than we uh, expected. Um, uh, even in the WTO, uh, India has highest, almost the highest uh, 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 committed uh, tariff level uh, among uh, uh, big developing countries. Uh, and also, as you said, in the case of ASEP, uh, India finally uh, left uh, the deal. Uh, so, um, so actually, I'm also curious about uh, uh, India's position in the uh, future uh, uh, IPEF negotiations, uh, because India is very uh, uh, conservative about uh, digital economy or uh, uh, e-commerce, just like in the in the. Uh, recently concluded MC12, uh, India actually uh, held uh, the, the uh, zero tariff on electronic uh, uh, transmission as a kind of uh, uh, leverage uh, to negotiate for its uh, uh, rights on, uh, on, on uh, food security. Uh, so um, again, as I said, I, I think India is very critical uh, but the problem is uh, India is very difficult to uh, accommodate in a, in a regional uh, framework. That could be a, maybe, I mean, a difficulty uh, for the uh, uh, regional integration. Thank you. Matt, any thoughts on? Yeah, I mean, India is clearly um, a pivotal um, country in this whole conversation. I mean, if you think just of this conversation about IPEF, um, against the backdrop of the two big um, international gathering, well, there are three if you count NATO, but two of the three big gatherings this week, the BRICS summit, India's there, uh, the G7, India's been invited. Um, so we're clearly, um, you know, we're clearly tussling over um, who's going to win over India's favor and get them involved in these, these arrangements. I mean, I'll be honest, as an economics, well, so I get it, why? Because India is a big, powerful, important country uh, strategically located with lots of um, uh, lots of things that we have potentially to work um, in in common with them, a big democracy. Um, but uh, but honestly, as an economic policy person who's been you know doing uh, on and off India related matters for for some time, you know they're very difficult. Um, in you know they've been they've been difficult in the WTO. Um, they've been difficult in the G20. They've been difficult in, uh, you know, in, in bilateral and other uh, trade um, forums. And I think on, when you look at some of the specific issues, um, I think it's going to be <clears throat> you know, interesting to see whether they will be willing to actually you know, agree to some of the high standards in, in the areas, particularly, as I say, the digital-related stuff. Dr. Tu just mentioned that. And I think that is one where it's hard to see how we're going to close the gap in our approaches to digital governance, um, quickly at least. 
Um, you know, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try, and, and it's important to have them in the room for a lot of reasons, but it's probably the single biggest concern I have in that sort of organizational and process part of my questions about IPEF is, you know, is India going to be a constructive or kind of destructive force in this, in this discussion? Thanks, Matt. So on, on the CPTPP question, if I may, Dr. Oba, would you care to offer thoughts? Uh, see, um, or, uh, about CPTPP, not that India. Well, uh, if you'd like to comment on India, feel free to do that as well. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah OK. So I, I'd like to start talk about the India at first. So yes, so many people talk about the India as a, a very difficult country to deal with. I think so. So I totally agree with this argument. But on the other hand, so nobody cannot ignore the India now. And then, so India is in the invited to the uh, Quad. So India is invited to the BRICS. And you know, India is invite, and invited to the uh, 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 IPF. And then, so it due to it, the, uh, their big size, so popularity and the potential of the economic development in the future. So and then, so it's very uh, key point to how to uh, in, embrace the India, so into the, uh, the regional order. This is a very difficult issue for us. But on the other hand, so it is uh, not avoidable issue for the, all of us. So this is my point. And then, so in addition to that, so India has uh, many uh, high-tech uh, engineers, engineers. And then, so of course, its uh, society is very um, uh, conservative, and uh, I, I know that. But on the other hand, it has a very potential for the uh, high-tech development, high-tech high technology development. So, and I move to the uh, CPTPP. Yes, CPTPP is a very important so framework for us, and it it uh, contains various issues, so various topics, so including the the not only the trade and uh, the the investment uh, liberalization, so but also. The other issue, so that the Dr. Cho already mentioned, the uh, state, uh, state, state company, state-owned and state-owned companies, and the other uh, things, and then so we have to um, uh, modify, modified the the rules, so all, uh, which is already set in the CPTPP, and then so to uh, contribute to the uh, formation of the new regional order. So in the in the Pacific or the Asia Pacific. Thank you, Dr. Oba. If I may. Simon Yan yes. on any of these topics. Thanks. I think on you? India, nobody spends more time on India than my country. My foreign <laughs> minister is just there again. Uh, I agree with what you said about difficulty, but it's too hard to leave alone as well. So I think uh, our logic as a small country is to do two things, a bit different from what has been said so far. The first is that uh, to move ahead. So RCEP. Uh, We've left the door open for them, but the key is to get RCEP moving so that as the RCEP helps even out supply chains across Northeast and Southeast Asia, uh, they can see what they're missing out. I, I think that's one of the lines that we were trying to bring to them in New Delhi, that as RCEP starts to move, you will miss, and the train is still in kind of taking off the station, you can still come on board. We're leaving the door open for them. Uh, but we're not really waiting for them to get on board before we move. The second is that uh, the outward India, the, the strength that Mayor Oba talked about, there are ways to catalyze that and get them to become the champion of a more open India domestically. So Singapore is fortunate to have become a kind of a second home, even before the pandemic, but even more so. So these outward-looking, very confident uh, uh, Indian conglomerates and entrepreneurs I think could be the kind of constituents who could then trigger the internal open market uh, uh, at some point, but engage the outward face of India first. Uh, that would be my logic on India uh, as a practical step. On the CPTPP, my country is actually the current chair of the uh, uh, process together in. Uh, I'm actually part of that uh, sort of group discussing it. So I can only say that I think besides the quality issue, which is actually been talked about already, and it's a very real one, 
there is the consensus issue, uh, just simply kind of old-fashioned blackballing. So unless China can uh, find some sort of peace with Australia, I'm not saying it's China's fault, I'm not saying it's Australia's fault, but uh, Australia has got the black ball in its hand. And so if the issue is pushed fast, that's a simple answer for China. Uh, it is my own hope that actually the reformers, and I, from Dr. Tu's remarks, I take him to be one, will use it uh, as a potential push. Uh, I, I, in, uh, again, going back to my call, my remarks, as, uh, we've got to know which China we're dealing with. Uh, there are elements of China which are really world class, uh, trying to continue with the WTO and other disciplines. There are others that you know, stop Filipino bananas from being taken off ships and leave the rot in the ship. And I think that if we can strengthen the reformers in China, I know it sounds a bit naive to say this, I think we should be trying to give them as much ammunition as they can so that as the domestic politics of China move forward, they have a chance to get back the voice some of them had when there was that WTO accession process. Matt, I think you wanted to well, come Well, I just in. want to add one thing about CPTPP. So um, I've, I've talked about the TPP saga as a kind of a Greek tragedy in the, in the traditional sense that it, it's a sort of self-inflicted uh, wound. Um, you know, we pushed this thing, then we withdrew from it, and now China's applying to join it, which is, is just uh, really um, uh, should be a real um, sending off alarm bells here. Not, by the way, not because China shouldn't be, should be contained or this has anything to do with geopolitics, just in terms of rulemaking, the U.S. had these great powerful ideas it wanted to promote in TPP and, and uh, you know, I think China's going to have a very different view on those, those rules. Um, but my, the point I wanted to make is, you know, I think for now Singapore, Japan, Australia will be sort of slow walking the Chinese application to CPTPP. You know, they're busy getting the UK in and getting you know, the, 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 the agreement implemented in their own countries and so forth. Um, but I think at some point, it's gonna be difficult for those countries uh, to resist taking on or taking seriously the Chinese application. Um, and I think uh, you know, it may not be this year, it may not be next year, but within two, three years, I think at some point, it's gonna be very hard for the existing CPTP, CPTPP members to say, you know, just go away, China, we, we don't have time to consider this. So I think, uh, I think people in Washington should be focused on that and, and realize that's a real possibility. And therefore the urgency of our own. And an urgency, China, therefore, of us, yeah. you know, making yeah. IPEF work, getting ourselves, as I said, I think we should be getting back to something like T CPTPP. Note, I did not say the U.S. should join CPTPP. I think we should be back in something like that. But um, there are different ways of doing that, but yes. Great, thank you. I now want to open the floor to questions. We have a handful of digital questions that have come in, but I first want to give the opportunity to anyone in the room here who would like to, to ask a question of our panelists. Somebody pointing back over here. Okay. Oh, the mic is there. Oh, so I guess we have to walk across the, the room and, and go to the mic, but please. Yeah, I'm afraid he, you're, going to have to, you're going to have to cross the room or start okay. online, maybe. There's okay. Well, maybe I'll start online. That's a, yeah, in the interest of smoothing things. Um, uh, so a number of questions here. One in particular relates to, and this comes from Serena Waters at NEC Corporation, um, looking at the, uh, the IPEF agenda, uh, and in particular the supply chain pillar. The question of what types of technology products might be might become the focus or areas of, of interest within that um, within that pillar. I mean, I think all this is work that is underway and being developed. Um, but Matt, I don't know if you have any sort I mean, of thoughts to offer at this stage on what the supply chain pillar of IPEF might address. There hasn't been a lot of detail provided yet publicly, um, so I don't have a clear answer to that. But I'm guessing that if you look at what the Biden administration itself has been focused on, you know, in its first 100 days, it did this review of four sectors, semiconductors, batteries, um, uh, critical minerals, and pharmaceutical and sort of medical um, uh, products. 
And uh, so I'm guessing that those will be the sort of the, the centerpiece of, of this effort. Um, my question about all this is what exactly is, again, the U.S. offering in this regard? Everybody wants the supply chain resilience, particularly in those kinds of important sectors, but what exactly are we doing to help make those things more resilient? So. Um, there are two people now waiting. Okay, great. You, well, I can't, can't really see, them, see but. you, but I'll uh, <laughs> Go ahead. invite the, the question, please. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Taishi Pitt, uh, Curtis Law Firm. Um, so, Matt, I liked your uh, description of IPEF and uh, how it's going to be like a building block for possibly uh, U.S. to get back into some sort of a comprehensive uh, trade deal uh, back in the region. Um, but I think a lot of the issues related to these trade agreements uh, is that a lot of people think, uh, you know, you, you, a lot of the voters won't necessarily uh, uh, be, go along with it. And kind of almost circumventing Congress to uh, uh, negotiate this deal uh, seems to be kind of contra uh, contrary to that whole approach. So I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, what do you think uh, Congress's role in negotiating IPEF will be. Okay, you want me to take that Please. one now? Um, so thank you. Great, great question. Um, uh, so a couple of things. First, you know, as, as I've, uh, you probably know, said and written, I do think that the U.S., that the, US, the administration ought to be engaging more with Congress and, in fact, I think should request uh, authority to negotiate a, a formal arrangement and then get it approved by Congress. That's very difficult, which, uh, uh, but it does do two things. It enables the U.S. to then offer credibly some you know, market access or something else that partners tangibly want from us, and say, because only Congress can provide you know, money or market access. And secondly, it provides durability because it, 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 it plants the pylons of these kinds of agreements deep into the soil um, as opposed to an executive agreement negotiated by just the administration. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, Congress is going to be unhappy. That's another whole set of issues, but I'll, I'm not going to get into the politics of that. But just one other point that underlies your question, which is, um, you know, there is this view that trade politics is very hard, and, you know, I see that and understand that argument. Um, but I think it's maybe not as hard as people think. I think that if you look at polling, you know, two-thirds of Americans support trade. Um, if you, and by the way, more Democrats than Republicans these days, which is interesting, and think about that. Um, you know, Congress just two years ago passed a major uh, trade agreement, the USMCA, the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, um, by overwhelming, you know, by, by partisan support. So it's possible. Um, the key is, what do we do to deal with the underlying dislocations caused by trade, but other technology and other changes in our economy. We ought to be taking those things on and having policies that directly address that, which get at some of the political dissatisfaction. But that doesn't mean we should stop doing trade. I mean, we can do both. We drive cars even though they cause accidents and death, um, and we put seat belts on and bumpers and speed limits you know, to, to mod mitigate the risk. But we go ahead and drive, and we should be doing that with trade. Thanks. We have time for one more question. Um, ideally also uh, for our other panelists as well, but please yeah. go ahead. Great. Thank you, uh, Evan Wright, Department of State. Um, we've talked a lot about inclusivity and uh, like supply chain resiliency, uh, but I think notably dis uh, missing from the conversation is Taiwan, right? Particularly when it comes to it being one of Japan's largest trading partners, one of the U.S.'s largest trading partners, and also incredibly uh, critical for, for the semiconductor supply chain. So. With that in mind, um, my question is a two-parter. Uh, one, uh, what role do you see for Taiwan, whether it's in RCEP, CPTPP, IPEF? And then two, uh, what role do you see Japan or the U.S. playing, uh, particularly when it comes to something like supply chain resiliency uh, in supporting Taiwan's uh, crucial place uh, in that uh, effort despite its unique position within the region? Thank you. Simon, would you like to take yes. the first crack at that? Well, I think first, uh, Singapore has a bilateral with Taiwan, and we've been friends with them for a long time. Um, that continues and, in fact, can grow. Similarly, uh, I had the pleasure of doing the APEC surveillance report on tai Taiwan a long time ago, and I found that um, one of the problems was that they weren't well enough integrated with China because of their own political issues and therefore were excluded from a lot of the supply chains across the region, which are, you know, at that time, particularly very China-centric. So if I take that forward to today, I would actually counsel that we must be very careful about 
trying to secure uh, chip supplies exclusively with Taiwan, with anybody. I can understand the, the, the scarcity and the logic of it, but I just, you know, in terms of the middle countries, the small countries, the system as a whole, I think it's actually very precarious to do that. Uh, I'm not even sure how WTO uh, uh, legal it is to fix particular products and sectors and make it exclusive. So I go back to the basics. I think we really need to engage Taiwan as an economy. I'm against people excluding it, but I'm not sure we should prefer it uh, in a negative way vis-a-vis uh, -vis the mainland. Similarly, for their application for CPTP membership, I think, again, the same two issues of quality and uh, 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 consensus will apply. And we should, of course, note the precedent is that uh, both Chinas can go in. Well, there's one, only one China, I know. Uh, but the order has generally been uh, uh, the mainland first. I, I don't know whether this can apply anymore given the heat, and partly is to take out some of the heat. Great, thank you. Uh, let, let me ask um, Dr. Tu or Dr. Oba whether you have any final thoughts on, on, these, on these subjects. Uh, Dr. Tu? Is there time for so closing? And then we'll close. Okay. Yeah. Nothing further. Dr. Oba, any, any final thoughts uh, on these? Yeah. Yes, so it's very uh, tough uh, the issue. So for, uh, it's a very tough issue, Taiwan. So, but I think so. Um, the joining of the CPTPP uh, Taiwan is uh, very uh, difficult. But uh, so we have to uh, make uh, some special uh, the status to Taiwan and uh, special uh, the agreement between the Taiwan and the CPTPP, and um, in order to secure the uh, uh, Taiwan providing the tip for us. Uh, to 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 make the uh, the supply chain resilience. This is uh, one uh, one kind of solution for us. So, but uh, so Taiwan the issue is uh, has a very uh, uh, politically uh, difficult so point. And then so of course the the best way is uh, also China and Taiwan join the CPTPP. This is the best for us. But uh, the, maybe we need to uh, find uh, a second best solution for both the China and the Taiwan. Thank you. Doug, we're, we're running short on time here, but Dr. Tu, I want to be sure you have a, a chance to say anything on this if you'd like. Okay. Uh, I think for China, the, the first, uh, uh, the top priority uh, for, for our application to the CPTPP is to improve uh, the diplomatic relations with uh, some CPTPP members. Uh, I think uh, as uh, Mr. Tai said, uh, 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 we have uh, made some maybe not so nice uh, diplomatic uh, policies uh, in recent years. Uh, but uh, I mean, a good, a good, relations, a good political relationship uh, is critical for our negotiation to join the CPTPP. Thank you. Well, I think that, that brings us to the end of our time. Let me uh, ask that we give a, a, a strong round of applause to our panelists. I think this has been a really terrific conversation. So thank you, Dr. Tu, Dr. Oba, Simon Tay, Matt Goodman, and thank you, Chairman Sasaki, for uh, your uh, wonderful remarks earlier. I think this has been a terrific conversation, and we look forward to continuing it uh, in the weeks and months ahead. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.